Thank you, Noel. Can you guys, can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah, okay. Well, um, I still have the, how much time do I have of this? Uh, four minutes or something. Same? Okay, yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank you for uh, giving me the time to talk to you today. Uh, over the course of my career, you know, this is my second stint at NASA. And in my first stint at NASA, I used to love uh, going to the Apple courses, like this one. Uh, I never got to come to Florida. I always had to go to Wallops Island, because a little closer. <laughs> and this is, this is definitely cooler. But, uh, you know, I'm actually really excited to be here with you all today. Uh, pretty much any time I can get out of Washington is a good day. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you about uh, the new technology programs uh, and really the plan embodied in the President's FY11 uh, budget request um, uh, for NASA. As you know, there's a lot of uh, debate over this plan. Um, I would caution you to uh, not believe the debate as it's been reported in the newspapers. Uh, you know, newspaper reporters are in the business of selling newspapers. And so it helps, you know, when they uh, dr 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 dramatize, uh, sensationalize the uh, story. I mean, there is definitely a vigorous debate, don't get me wrong. And uh, those of us in Washington are right in the middle of it. Uh, but it's not exactly as it's been reported, uh, in my view. And uh, so what I want to do is, uh, if it's okay with you guys, is I want to walk you through at least the way I view uh, the President's budget request. Now, you need to realize that uh, I, I came back to NASA on February 1st, the day the budget was rolled out. So uh, it was quite an exciting day, and it's been quite an exciting uh, three months as a result. And I should also admit to you up front my bias, okay? Um, I had a great job at Georgia Tech. In fact, I have a great job at Georgia Tech. Um, you know, I left NASA in 2003. I went to Georgia Tech. I've been on the faculty in aerospace engineering, uh, working with undergraduate and graduate students, uh, mostly on uh, advanced technology projects for NASA, sometimes for the DOD, but mostly for NASA. Um, and that job, you know, really gets my juices going. It's just something I really like. And I'm telling you that because I made the conscious choice to leave that life that I liked and come be the chief technologist at NASA in this time of change. Um, so you can imagine where I sit on this, uh, this debate, right? I'm obviously, and I'll you know, admit it up front, I'm obviously in favor of the President's FY11 budget request, uh, or I wouldn't have left Georgia Tech, okay? Just, just so you know where I stand. And let me walk through that uh, a little bit and explain to you why. Okay? And by the way, if you want to wait with questions at the end, that's fine, or if you want to ask as I go through this, that's, that's fine as well. So this is a, a summary. Uh, you guys probably all have this material. Um, I'm told that it gets posted, you know, as soon as I give a presentation, it gets posted somewhere, it seems like. Um, that's also a big change for me. Nobody used to care. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure they still care, but they, they definitely post it. Um, so here's a summary from my perspective of the President's FY11 budget request. A couple of key points. Uh, and you've probably heard some of these points already, but let me just say them again. NASA got a top-line budget increase. Uh, it's about $300 million in FY11, and over the five-year uh, projected budget, we're talking about uh, $6 billion of an increase. And that's important to me for one reason. Uh, this is a very challenging time for our country economically. And as you know, uh, the discretionary part of, of the federal budget was capped by President Obama. It did not increase. Uh, you know, discretionary funding excluding defense did not increase. Okay, that means that if NASA got an increase, somebody else actually took a cut. Okay, that's something that's, you know, a little difficult for people at NASA, even myself included, to, to realize. If you look across the federal government and you look at who got increases, you'll find that all of the federal agencies that were doing research and technology, or that the president and the administration would like to be doing research and technology, got increases. And all the federal agencies that were not doing research and technology took cuts so to pay for the agencies that did get an increase. Okay, that's a, 
That's a theme in the federal budget that you need to be aware of. Uh, so we got this top line increase. Uh, that increase was distributed. Uh, there was a, a relatively large, in my view, increase for science, uh, primarily for <coughs> earth science, two and a half billion over five years. Uh, aeronautics got what I would call a, a modest increase. It's actually pretty large, um, you know, 15 percentage-wise at least. It's 15 percent, which is, uh, you know, reduces the decline in aeronautics that had been ongoing for five or ten years. Uh, Dollar-wise, it's small because the aeronautics budget is small. Uh, and perhaps the thing that you've heard about the most and the thing that's been debated the most is the shift in human exploration. And I'm going to talk about that a lot more on the coming slides. But there's a couple points there. One, the goal of our human exploration program has not changed. The goal today is the same as the goal three months ago and the same as the goal a couple years ago. The goal is to extend human presence beyond low Earth orbit. Okay? It, what has changed is the approach by which NASA is pursuing that goal. Uh, and here are some of the characteristics just from a budget perspective about that changed approach. There, is an there are additional funds to complete what were five remaining shuttle flights, what today there we're down to three, potentially four, I guess, remaining shuttle flights. Uh, the inclusion of the ISS, the extension of the ISS, and the full utilization of the ISS as a national laboratory through 2020. Bringing I putting ISS as the central focus of our human spaceflight program. This is a major shift as well, one that's, by the way, very underreported in my view. Uh, extending ISS through at least 2020. The commercial approach to low Earth orbit access, we just heard a little bit about that. Uh, there's $6 billion in the budget over five years uh, to foster uh, commercial industry in providing LEO access. There's modernization of the Kennedy Space Center launch complex, which you all know, uh, like many of the facilities at NASA, uh, hasn't had significant upgrades in decades uh, and is, you know, in some cases, rather old. Um, the flexible path strategy to human exploration beyond low Earth orbit, I'm sure you've read about that in the Augustine Committee report. It actually wasn't originally their idea. It's been around for a while, but the latest version of that is captured in Augustine's report. Uh, and of course, the other thing that has been discussed over and over and over again in the press is the cancel cancellation or restructuring of the Constellation program. Uh, to include a, an update in mid-April, uh, a modified Orion development continuing uh, as a crew return vehicle and, and as a technology test bed for future missions. Uh, you heard a lot about this theme, the shift in approach for the human exploration program. What you may not have heard as, as much about, and what I want to focus on today, is this significant focus on technology development. Sure, it's there. It's always in the newspaper articles. It's down like in the third or fourth paragraph. It's never, you know, it always says, Obama cancels moon program, right? And then down in the, on page four, it says, by the way, there's a big focus on technology. Um, it's this focus on technology that uh, I was excited about personally and is why I came back to NASA, uh, to this position. Uh, there's a, a strong focus on technology in our human exploration strategy, and there's both technology pull programs that I'll define in just a moment, and technology push programs uh, that we are formulating to begin in FY11. Uh, there's also a major increase in emphasis on partnerships. The Obama administration is all about partnerships. They want us to partner across government agencies. They want us to partner internationally. They want us to partner with academia and industry. And they are incentivizing all the government agencies to engage in these partnership activities in full. Right? It's part of their strategy, frankly, because the discretionary budget is capped. Right? And it may actually go down next year. Okay? So we need to think about that. Uh, where's the? Here it is. So let me jump into human exploration, because uh, I imagine that's maybe the topic that most people are interested in. Um, there is a renewed emphasis uh, on, on, of technology in the President's FY11 budget. And in my view, what the budget really represents at its highest level is a balancing among the three long-standing core competencies of NASA. If you think back in time, and you, in your head, you think about what is NASA? 
What makes NASA unique? Why is NASA not the Air Force? Why is it not NSF? Why is it NASA? There's some things that come to your mind, at least to my mind. What comes to my mind are a strong research and technology competency, a strong flight hardware development competency, and a strong mission operations competency. In fact, it's the synergy of all three of those core competencies that make NASA the unique agency that it is. There, there is no other place in this country where those three things are together. And it's because that NASA embodies those three core competencies, and always has, actually. You can go all the way back to the Space Act and the formation of NASA, and it calls out these three critical core competencies. It's because NASA embodies all three of those competencies is why NASA is so inspiring to young people, right? If all we do is research and technology, right? So I'm the chief technologist, and I'll tell you this. If all we do is research and technology, and we don't do flight hardware development, we don't do mission operations, then what's the point? We're just NSF, right? We're just off playing in our sandbox, developing little toys, technology toys. I don't want that. On the other hand, if we don't have any research and technology, and we're just building flight hardware, and and flying it, then we can only take uh, what I would call a rather incremental approach to that flight hardware development. Right? So to me, a healthy NASA, a NASA on the cutting edge, is strong in research and technology, in space flight hardware development, and in mission operations. And what the President's FY11 budget request really embodies is kind of a bringing up of the research and technology competency by the way, not to an equal point. There's still more dollars in flight hardware development and mission operations, as there probably should be. But bringing it up to the point where it's actually visible. Because over the past decade, research and technology in NASA has been uh, almost drummed out of business, frankly. And that's not my opinion, by the way. That's the opinion of a whole host of external panels that have looked at this over and over again, including an NRC committee that reported back uh, just a day or two ago about the abysmal state of the research uh, of the laboratories and the R&D and technology development programs within NASA. That's their word, by the way, abysmal state. It's, it's not my word. Okay. So that, that top line there is important. Okay. That's, that's the way you need to think, in my view. That's, that's the way I think about the budget. Now, for human exploration, what does this mean? Well, it means uh, a whole host of technology development and demonstrations, and I'll show you some of those in just a minute, uh, designed to reduce the cost and prove the required capabilities for our future human exploration systems. It means things like heavy lift propulsion technology. Uh, it means things like in-space propulsion technology in this one program. It means robotic precursors to some of the destinations where we want to send humans to. You know, if we want to really send humans to an asteroid in 2025, uh, I'd certainly like to. It probably makes sense to visit that asteroid or several asteroids like the one we might want to visit robotically first. Right? If we really want to send humans to Mars, there are a number of things that we need to learn about Mars uh, from a safety perspective, from a risk perspective, uh, before we send humans there. Uh, the fourth uh, on this list is a greatly increased program of human research, human research program. Uh, basically, uh, long-term human adaptation to space, utilizing the International Space Station uh, to prepare for long journeys. Right? Going to a near-Earth asteroid is a lot different right, than going to the moon. Uh, it's, going, it's venturing into deep space. To me, there's something really exciting about that. We're actually going to leave the Earth's sphere of influence. Right? When we go to the moon, we don't really do that. Uh, but going into deep space for months at a time, we will. And there are things, uh, you know, if we want to keep, we need to keep the humans safe, and there's, there's radiation protection, there's adaptation to the microgravity environment, uh, there's environmental control and life support systems uh, that we need to greatly improve to do that. Uh, a U.S. commercial human spaceflight cap capability to get to low Earth orbit. Now, how are we going to make these technology investments? And this is a key point. The way we're going to go about that is by identifying the needed capabilities and then investing in multiple competing approaches, multiple competing technologies to achieve that capability. The challenge with this program is that, in my view, 
we're not actually wise enough today to know exactly what technology is the one that's going to allow us to send humans to Mars or send humans to an asteroid. Right? So we don't want to, you know, I, I for one, don't want to bank my entire human exploration program on some technology that's not yet proven. So instead, we know there's a certain capability that we need, and we need to invest in multiple competing approaches to advance that capability, and then make a down selection a little bit later in time, and take that down selected technology and prove it in a flight relevant environment. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that uh, in just a minute. Now, the other thing that people ask me all the time is, well, we're going to spend two years figuring out what technologies or what capabilities we need to go after. Well, thankfully, we don't need to. Um, in my office today, you can, you can come to my office anytime and you can see, I have a stack of reports. And they go from the floor to almost my height. I'm just barely taller than the stack. I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm taller than the stack. <laughs> it's like the only thing that I'm taller than. Um, and and this, these reports are all, by the way, they're, they're done by blue ribbon panels, presidential panels. They're done by NASA folks. They're done by NRC. They're done you know, by all kinds of groups. And here's a list of some of them. Going all the way back on the left to 1969, the post-Apollo uh, space group, the space task group that was chartered to figure out what are we going to do after the Apollo mission? What kind of technologies do we need to invest in to enable future human exploration? 1969. Jumping forward in time to 1986, pioneering the space frontier, which by the way, if you haven't read it, is perhaps the most well done report on this subject of all time. It is by far and away my favorite report. Uh, done, you know, the, the leader, the chairman of that report was Tom Paine. Uh, it's wonderfully uh, presented. Uh, and then you can jump forward, you know, we can jump over Sally Ride's report in 87, some internal NASA reports, including the 90 day study um, that I was, and uh, actually Phil Sumrall were, were a part of back in 89. Um, the for Augustine won in 1990, his first report, going all the way to the latest Augustine report on the right hand side. Now, you might not be able to read this slide all the way in the back. But what I've listed here in the rows are some of the technologies that these reports have said we should invest in. Closed loop life support, in space propulsion, heavy lift launch vehicle, entry, descent, and landing, lightweight structures and materials, um, advanced EVA systems, so on, uh, communications technology. Okay? And you see the X's? There's a remarkable consistency from report to report. We know what capabilities we need. We know. It's been documented over and over again. It's right here. What we need is to sy synthesize this information and use it to develop plans forward. Right, these are the capabilities. What are the technological solutions that provide these capabilities? So we can take these capabilities and we can, you know, if you wanted to do it purely in a competed environment, you could imagine like a call coming out for each one of these capabilities and different teams could, could propose back different technological solutions. Or we could take one of these capabilities and we could say, JSC, you guys go lead a team to do this. Langley, you go lead a team to do that. Marshall, you go lead a team to do that. And we'll try three different approaches. Right? We could do this either way. And what we're planning to do, actually, is a combination of both. There'll be both directed assignments and competed uh, opportunities. Now, why am I standing on my soapbox about technology? Okay? It's not for the very next mission. We don't need to invest in technology if all we want to do is go to the space station. Okay? Or if all we want to do is stay in the general vicinity of the Earth. But as we start considering destinations like sending humans to an asteroid, or in my view, the grand challenge of them all, sending humans to the surface of Mars, technology development becomes very important. And this slide from Johnson Space Center illustrates why. What we have here on the y-axis is the amount of mass required at the beginning of the mission, not on the ground, but in low Earth orbit. Okay? So to start one human, round trip human Mars mission, I need that amount of mass in low Earth orbit. I have to somehow lift it all up to low Earth orbit. The reason this slide, I think, is interesting is it's plotted in units of International Space Station mass. Okay? So with current technology, all the way on the left hand, all the way on the left hand side, I need something like 12 international space stations assembled in low Earth orbit for one round trip Mars mission. Okay? 
I mean, at that point, should we even be having this dialogue? I mean, if I take this to Congress, I know I'll be thrown out of the room, right? And, and rightfully so, OK? But with an investment in technology, I can bring the number of international space station masses down to something that approaches, let's say, two. Now, two is still a grand challenge, right? It took us almost a decade to get to one on this axis. Uh, but you have to also realize that about 80% of this mass is propellant, OK? And if we're fostering a commercial industry, and if we're talking about propellant depots and in-space resource utilization, well then, the fact that 80% of that mass is propellant really helps me. And even if that doesn't come through, if I get the, the amount of mass required in low Earth orbit down to something like two, we can at least have a discussion about the possibility of one day sending humans to the surface of Mars. As long as it's over 10, in my view, an order of magnitude off, it's out of our reach. It's beyond our grasp. Okay? And this, to me, uh, graphically, is the power of technology development, the possibility. Now, uh, President Obama, when he spoke in Florida on April 15th, he laid out a set of destinations and a set of dates. Uh, he talked about early crewed missions of our new exploration system in the first part of the next decade. He talked about humans going to a near-Earth asteroid in 2025 orbiting Mars in 2035 and returning safely, um, which I certainly would hope for. <laughs> and uh, then he threw in, uh, which I greatly appreciate, he threw in landing on the surface at Mars, of Mars at some point in the future, but he didn't give a date. He did say in his lifetime. That's important to me because he and I are about the same age, <laughs> and uh, I would very much like to see that. So at a high level, this is where we are in my view, in the human spaceflight program. Um, in this decade, what we're talking about is involving the commercial sector, both in launch and in other ways. We're talking about robotic precursors, and we're, talk we're talking about utilizing the International Space Station as the core of our human spaceflight program, flying it out, if you will, through its full life of 2020 and potentially beyond. And we're talking about technology development to enable the systems development for the next human spaceflight system in the starting perhaps in the 2015 time frame so that we can get to a uh, near earth asteroid by 2025 so in 2015 or so we're talking about the design and development of heavy lift systems and in space capabilities that would allow us to achieve that mission with the operations for those missions in the first part of the next decade first in the Earth's vicinity, and then eventually uh, to a near-Earth asteroid. Now, uh, a lot has been said about our technology development program in the press, right? How do we know what technologies to invest in? We don't have any goals. Well, that's not true. I mean, it might make a good soundbite on the news, but it's frankly not true. We have goals. The president clearly enunciated those goals on April 15th. And what we also have at NASA is a great team of people working right now through an activity called HEFT, the Human Exploration Frameworks team, that's synthesizing all of the formulation work that's been done to date and putting in place an integrated plan. Those of you that know about the Exploration Systems Architecture Study, the HEFT is doing uh, what I would call something equivalent to that, but for the flexible path approach. And that is kind of illustrated on this slide, right? If we have a set of goals, like we do, an asteroid mission in 2025, going to Mars, uh, in orbit about Mars in 2035, to the surface after that, from those goals, we can develop mission architectures. From those mission architectures, we can develop flight system concepts. From those flight system concepts, we can develop the technologies required to enable those spacecraft, to enable those missions, to enable those goals. It's a nice requirements flow down kind of approach. And this is the approach that ESMD, the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate, is using through the HEFT team. This is not the only way we're doing technology development, but it is a big part of the plan, right? And it's organized in a very, what you would call a systems engineering uh, way. This is what the team has come up with to date, okay? And I know that it's maybe hard to view in the back of the, uh, the room here, but uh, without going through each individual line, I want you to notice a couple things. One, there are a lot of missions. There are actually a lot of things 
And in terms of sheer number, there are a large number of technology development items that are going to go into space. There are a large number of launches as a result, and there are a large number of mission op operations opportunities as a result. There are also a large number of hardware development opportunities to get these technologies ready uh, and to develop them and fly them. Right? Whether we're talking about the human research program or the heavy lift program, which has both uh, a launch and an in-space component, there are development opportunities. This is not a technology program that is all about um, you know, playing in our academic labs. This is a technology program that spans concepts, ground and laboratory testing, flight testing, and testing in space. Okay. Um, now, one last, uh, one last point on some of these missions. There's also been a lot of talk about the need for these robotic precursor missions. You know, why do we need these robotic precursor missions? We didn't, you know, really have that many robotic precursors before we sent the astronauts to the moon, which, by the way, isn't true. <laughs> we did. Um, but I hear that a lot in the press. Well, Ranger. Sure, Ranger would be a, another one. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but here's, here's my answer to that. This is a very recent result. Uh, this is not a robotic precursor mission, by the way. Uh, this is from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a science mission which has been circling Mars for quite some time. And what it sh um, MRO has been there long enough that it has actually overflown the same region, you know, over a time period. And it'll fly over this region and take an image and then fly over it, say, a few months later and take the same image at the same time of day and they'll see a drastic difference, right? Look at the top two pictures and the amount of white that's present there and look at the bottom two pictures uh, and the amount of white there. What MRO has uncovered is a very large amount of ice, water ice, very close to the surface and by the way, at mid-latitudes, not near the poles, at mid-latitudes. This is roughly the latitude of uh, Boston, let's say, okay? Uh, the ice layer is about uh, a half to one meter below the surface. This was totally unknown a year ago. Actually, totally unknown six months ago. Right? Six months ago, uh, we were all talking about methane. We need a methane in-space engine. Why do we need a methane in-space engine? Because we're going to go to Mars and we can make methane you know, out of the Mars atmosphere, and therefore we need that engine. Look at this water. All of a sudden, LOX hydrogen's back in the picture. Seriously, with its higher performance. Harder to store, but higher performance. This is the kind of thing, and I'm not saying that you know, we, we need to throw away all the methane plants. That's not what I'm saying at all, and go LOX hydrogen. I'm saying these are the kinds of discoveries that greatly affect the architecture that we will use to do human exploration. And this is why we need robotic precursor missions. So to summarize the human exploration program, uh, in the, as contained in the President's FY11 budget. Uh, a couple points. The goal of the program has not changed. The goal of the program is to extend human presence beyond low Earth orbit. What has changed is the approach to accomplishing that goal. The President's approach focuses on developing the technological capabilities required for humans to reach multiple destinations. Not just the Moon, but the Moon and near-Earth asteroids and eventually Mars. The investments that we hope to, that we plan to make uh, are focused on gaining the knowledge needed to inform our future architectural decisions and building the capabilities, the technological capabilities required for humans to, to venture not just beyond low Earth orbit, but into deep space itself to leave the Earth. Right? That's something we all, I believe we all want. Uh, and in my view, this approach will expand the alternatives that are possible through, for human exploration through timely, strategic, and significant technology investment. Now, I talked to you about what we're doing in the human exploration program, but before I end, let me tell you what we're doing in the other parts of the technology development programs. Uh, by the way, I mentioned to you already, uh, I know you can't read this, you just have to trust me on this one. Um, I mentioned to you already that there were a whole bunch of external inputs that were made about the need to improve the research and technology competency at NASA. This is a list of them. 
There are, let's see, one, two, three, four NRC reports from 2008 to 2010. There's an authorization act by Congress in 2008. And then there's the Augustine Committee report. They all say the same thing. They all say that NASA has underinvested in research and technology. By the way, not just in the Bush administration. This is not about the Bush administration versus the Clinton, versus the, uh, what do we got, Obama administration? <laughs> That's not what this is. We've, we've underinvested in research and technology for over a decade, Democrat and, and Republican uh, administrations alike. And that's what these reports cite. You're welcome to read into the details in these reports, but they all talk about new ways that NASA should increase its technology focus. They talk about spending something like 10% of NASA's budget on non-mission focused technology. Um, and there, are, and there are a number of reasons given for that. So uh, I'm the NASA chief technologist, and one of my responsibilities is to plan out all of the NASA technology programs, those within the mission uh, directorates, and the new technology program called the Space Technology Program. That's a brilliant name. Uh, I didn't come up with it. Uh, within my office, the office of the chief technologist. And here is a view of all of those technology programs together. What I have at the top is the space technology program. And what I have uh, on the bottom here is just Exploration Systems Mission Directorate as one example of a mission directorate. You should realize that there's technology investments being made in science, certainly in aero, and in SOMD uh, as well. Uh, but for ESMD, these are the programs that they're formulating. And across the bottom here, I have technology readiness level, right? So TRL of one. Your concept studies, your system studies are all the way over here on the left. And flight missions, operational missions, are over here on the right, right? Our operational portfolio of missions. Uh, within space technology, there will be uh, low TRL programs. We're going we're gonna to look broad and wide for the best ideas, wherever those ideas may be. We're going to look internal at NASA. We're going to look at academia. We're going to look internationally. We're going to look at, our, at industry. Uh, you may remember the uh, NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts. Anybody remember that? OK, it was around for uh, a large number of years. Uh, its budget was cut um, a few years ago, partially to make room for Constellation. Uh, it was, by the way, it wasn't a, in my view, it wasn't purposely cut. It was just out with the sweep, you know, there was a sweeping done of all the technology programs at NASA at that time. And the NIAC was eliminated uh, along with a number of other things. Uh, we're going to reinstate the NIAC. We're going to reinstate the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts. That's one example of the kind of concept development program that we're going to have. It's not the only one, but it's just one example. Uh, over here in the middle of the page, we have what I call your mid-TRL kind of things, your TRL 3, 4, 5 kind of programs. This is where all your ground-based testing, your laboratory programs are going to be. Um, you know, I've done a lot of concept studies in my life. And I'll tell you, on paper, they all look beautiful. <laughs> and every time I get involved in a concept study, there's only like this, this one little piece of physics right, that's holding it back. If only I could prove this little piece of physics work, then the whole system would look great, just like I've shown on this, in this system study. Well, we're going to go after those little pieces of physics in these programs, both within the mission directorates and within my office, the uh, Office of the Chief Technologist. And then we're going to take some of those things, some of those uh, pieces of physics that we prove in the lab, prove that they are feasible, and we're going to take them to flight. And we're going to prove those technologies in a, in a space environment. Now, we've done this before, right? Uh, does anybody remember the uh, New Millennium Program? Actually, it still exists, I believe. It's, it's in its last days, uh, but it still exists. Uh, it was funded out of the Science Mission Directorate. And that is the closest thing that I can think of uh, to one of these kinds of programs where we're going to flight. Right? So if you want to think about past programs, this is a NIAC-like program. This is like a fundamental arrow for space. This is a space equivalent of the fundamental aeronautics program. And then out here is the New Millennium Program. Now you might ask me, well, why do I have two parallel lines? Okay, why do I have stuff shown both in the mission directorates 
and in this new program that I've called the Space Technology Program in the Office of the Chief Technologist. And there's a really good reason for that. The mission directors are doing what I already discussed. They have their goals, they have their architectures, their spacecraft, and their technologies. They're doing what you might call a requirements flow-down approach. Okay? But if we're talking about sending humans to Mars, do we really want to bank our whole human exploration architecture on the specific technology that the mission directorates think is going to pan out today? Or do we want to consider some alternate approaches in parallel? And that's what we can do up here in the space technology program. I call that disruptive technology development, or I call it technology push. Because these are technology investments being made not because the next mission is planning to use them, but because if they come through, and some of them will, and by the way, some of them won't, but if they come to fruition, they'll enable major advances in the way we approach our system. Does anybody have, uh, anybody have one of these? Anybody? I got one. Right? Who doesn't? Ten years ago, did you? <laughs> Very good, No, You're the smartest man in the room. <laughs> Ten years ago, did you have one? Fifteen years ago? I don't think so, right? We all can't, we can't put our cell phones down now. Cell phone, I mean, this is not a space example, okay? But the cell phones change the way we do business. They change the way we think. Uh, the internet is another example, right? My kids don't actually understand that there didn't used to be an internet. <laughs> uh, what do you mean there was no internet? You didn't always have Google, right? They just can't understand that. Right? It's changed the way we do things. Well, in my view, some of the technologies that we're going to pursue here will change the way we approach human exploration, will change the way we approach our science missions. Now, once again, they won't all pan out, and we have to be willing to accept that. We're going to take a lot of risk in this program. Uh, we're going to make our bets uh, in, a, in an informed manner, um, kind of like, uh, you know, I assume that you're all in the thrift savings program or some program like that, right? I mean, how do you decide what stocks to pick? It's the same thing. You, you, you balance your risk through a portfolio approach. And that's what we're going to do in the space technology program. Uh, so here's kind of my view of how this is going to work. We're going to start with uh, visions of the future, thousands of visions of the future. These will come from all over. They'll come from within NASA and from outside of NASA. Uh, there'll be paper studies, systems analyses, technology assessments, cost-benefit studies. All right? They'll all have this little piece of physics that needs to get proven before we can really accept them as science fact as opposed to science fiction. Right? In this part of the program, that's what we'll focus on. We'll use our laboratories, we'll use ground-based testing, we'll use uh, you know, whatever we need to prove that that fundamental physics works. And when it does, We'll be over here, and we'll take some of those to flight readiness. We'll take them to low Earth orbit. We'll do atmospheric flight testing, whatever it takes for that particular technology to be at TRL 6 so that a mission uh, would be willing to adopt it. And we'll then infuse those technologies in our future science and exploration missions, but we'll also infuse them in other government agency missions, and we'll infuse them into industry um, through this approach. Now, I can't just put out a call, right? It's gonna, this program, by the way, is going to be largely competitive, unlike the approaches in the mission directorates, right? This is another difference between the space technology program, which, by the way, you know, the Office of Chief Technologist is not a mission directorate. It's set up that way on purpose, okay? Um, this will be done largely in a competitive way, uh, be open to all, best ideas from wherever they may come. But I can't just put out a call and say, hey, Technology, bring it on. What do you got? You know, any technologies. So instead, what we're going to do is uh, what you might call a grand challenge kind of approach. And there is a, a very successful set of models for doing this, right? This is DARPA does this all the time. ARPA E, which just got uh, just got stood up, uh, does this kind of approach. Now, by the way, don't read too much into these words here. We're still working on this slide. Um, this is, I just wanted to put this up here so you know, I could talk to it and give you an idea of what we're thinking. But we're going to come out with, uh, the Office of the Chief Technologist is going to come out with a set of grand challenges. We're not going to talk about technological solutions. 
We're going to talk at the capability level. We want this capability by this date. And then we're going to put that out. And NASA centers or academia or industry will respond with a variety, I believe, of technological solutions to provide that capability. And we will fund several of those for each grand challenge going forward to a point that we can make an informed decision uh, about which is the best technology to take all the way to flight. I think I'll skip that one. Uh, here's a, just an artist picture of some of the kinds of things that might come out of this program. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of technologies, by the way, that whether you've been doing science missions or whether you've been focused on human exploration, you know you have wanted. If you're an engineer, you know you have wanted these systems for a long time, right? And we never seem to be able to get over the hump of uh, funding these to the point that they're at a, at a technology readiness level that the mission directorates will pick them up or that some other government agency will pick them up. Uh, through the space technology program, uh, we have a means for doing so. In fact, we have a means to take things all the way from concept to flight, which is something we've never had at NASA before on the technology side of the house. Okay, so just to kind of sum things up, um, in my view, uh, and it is, by the way, this is, you know, everyone has a different opinion on this subject, and uh, I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, but what the Obama administration is really saying in its FY11 budget request for NASA is bigger than what the newspapers are reporting. Okay? What the Obama administration is really saying is that we're committed to research, technology, and innovation for the nation uh, as a means of stimulating the economy. That's really what they care about, right? They care about the economy and they care about preparing America to compete on the global stage technologically. And they're allowing NASA, by the way, it's a great privilege. You, you really need to think about this. It's a great privilege. They're allowing NASA to be part of this national strategy. NASA's not always part of the na nation's strategy. Sometimes it's kind of, you know, off on the side doing its own thing. Uh, this administration, the Obama administration, is by giving NASA a budget increase and turning it towards more of a research and technology focused, is saying that NASA, you're a part of this national initiative. So the NASA budget request is really aligned with this national strategy, right? And once again, the renewed emphasis on technology, uh, by the way, which has been suggested over and over again by a number of external groups, is really, in my view, a rebalancing of NASA's three fundamental core competencies that have really always been in existence. Uh, now, what this will do for NASA, in my view, is it will provide uh, a much more likely set and a much more exciting set of potential futures for our science and exploration missions. Okay? It'll definitely improve, in my view, the space program. 